uh, good morning and today we will discuss uh, um, a new topic about uh, the architecture of the web um, it's a bit uh, a long topic so i will probably split it in two uh, videos part one and part two um, so what the goal is to try to get familiar with uh, the main components the main uh, um, uh, protocols and languages uh, uh, that compose uh, uh, a web system today the architecture web system today um, the, um, the goal is not uh, to go into details about each of the technologies right now but at least to have the big picture then we will have time later on uh, during the course to go into details about uh, uh, s most uh, uh, of these uh, of these technologies that we are uh, mentioning today um, so actually the goal of this presentation is understanding you know, the architecture of the web and uh, uh, when i'm talking about architecture in the context of uh, uh, computer science uh, i mean which are the components so the blocks so the pieces that are uh, needed that are used uh, to create a, a web system uh, I, i'm trying to be generic uh, right now with the definition of web that will come of course uh, um, uh, later on with more details and these components need to communicate uh, with each other so there will be network protocols network connection who is expected to communicate with whom uh, um, is uh, also part of the topology of this uh, architecture that we are building and this architecture will be common to all uh, actually uh, all the web uh, um, system that the uh, and application that we have today and also of course each of these components uh, can, should be programmed so uh, there are programming languages there are some declarative languages which are not really pro programmable but uh, in, in any way they must be written but must be developed by by a programmer uh, so we have a look also what are these kinds of languages and we see that uh, the web is composed of an intermix uh, of standard components so there are components that don't depend on the type of website that you are creating so you're creating website one or two or three this component will always be the same versus programmable components where actual uh, customization and development uh, occurs and of course in this case this programmable component must be developed customly uh, for each of these uh, application areas and and of course uh, we should understand how these components uh, communicate and collaborate in delivering the final web application the overall web application uh, the outline is uh, mainly divided in four main chapters. We start with some definitions uh, and then we expand what happened in the server side. It would be a sort of a chronological overview um, uh, on the complexity uh, of, the, uh, of the technology that is needed on the server side to deliver a web application. And then we will have probably a break there and then continue with the, uh, what happened in the client uh, on the other hand. Uh, uh, they were uh, standing still for the first uh, 15 years or more or less okay uh, so let's start with some first definitions um, the um, web architecture is uh, as most uh, you know uh, things in computer engineering is a layered architecture so we have many levels or many layers or many tires depending on how you call them and uh, uh, like it happens with the network uh, uh, architectures uh, but imagine that all the uh, network levels, so the ISOs, the levels, and so on, are all packed in this green block internet infrastructure. So we, here we have the network levels, and on one side of the network below, we have the server technology, and on the other side of the network, we have the client technologies. So we have the internet that is separating the client from the server. And usually the client uh, is a browser, uh, the browser that we are using, and the server is a mix of different components. Uh, the, the, on the server side, we have usually at least three diff different layers, uh, and uh, uh, each layer has a specific role, has a specific goal, has a specific functionality to achieve. Usually, in layered architecture, each layer depends on the layer below and provides services to the layer uh, above it. Okay? So the, the browser receives services from the web server, which receives services from the application server, which receives services <coughs> from the database server so we start by looking uh, at this pyramid from the web server down because we want to look at uh, we decided we look first at the web server uh, there, sorry at the um, uh, web uh, uh, the server part and then we'll uh, in the second part of the presentation we have a look at what, uh, of what happens on the browser on the client you see that this is not, is not a classical pyramid because it has two tips and there's two bottoms 
uh, this is just to suggest that the web architecture is an open architecture uh, where uh, usually the client uh, is a browser but you may also have other types of clients other types of clients means other applications other tools maybe if you have uh, you know a surveillance camera connected to the internet that would act uh, as a client uh, because it needs to talk with some server to exchange data to save the images and so on and to be configured also so it's an object uh, this, that acts as a client uh, um, to some web server it's not a real browser or on the other hand or even if you have a software you may be you know saving documents on the cloud so you are using uh, uh, microsoft office and you want to save documents in the cloud well the client in this case is microsoft office that will contact its server uh, on on the back uh, on the background so you don't see it uh, you don't navigate it through it but the, the, the software will um, make requests uh, web requests to the server so uh, uh, the success uh, of the web architecture is, is also this one because uh, many other type of applications uh, have now rely now use now reuse uh, the technologies that were invented for the web because they were so successful so open and so flexible and by the way also free and um, oh, the same happens on the back end where uh, usually the application server is the uh, level that is really building the logic of the application and uh, uh, this logic uh, uh, must work on some data so usually a website hosts some data in a database uh, and th these are the data that the, the that website needs uh, to operate but in some times some cases for uh, the um, the website uh, does not have all the data mm -hmm. some data is not available directly uh, in their databases uh, so it should be available externally so i call them third party services some people tend to call them cloud services uh, uh, i try to be more general because they not they may not are uh, may not be real cloud services maybe just uh, some uh, simple api that we can call externally but this means that uh, um, the application server itself may access their own data and also other data from external parties and by the way the uh, i didn't zoom that but uh, it is somewhat recursive because at this layer how can the application server access third-party services well actually here it's doing a web call a web request call so actually in this case the application server is acting like a client uh, towards some third-party service it will expose their services most likely as a web server hmm? so, but we'll come on to that just uh, the, i just wanted to to show uh, the the, uh, say the flexibility uh, of this uh, of this pyramid where the, the individual components uh, can be mixed also in different ways um, so uh, if we want if you want to make this picture simpler and uh, we need to make it simpler because we then need to make it the more complicated one except the time uh, the general picture is that we have a client uh, that will connect to the server to a web server through uh, the internet and uh, uh, the client uh, um, we said historically is a web browser but we mentioned that it may, it may also be some other kind uh, of application our focus initially will be on the server uh, and the server you see that is plural because we have different types of servers uh, corresponding to the different layers of the pyramid and the three main uh, layers that we are going to discuss today are a web servers application servers and database servers hmm? uh, again with the possible s because this uh, uh, may be just one of them or maybe multiple uh, servers uh, working together the same layer there can also of course be um, other types of servers that one can imagine or deploy into a uh, web application slow authentication server encryption servers and so on but uh, uh, we, all, we will not touch those uh, during this course of course in a complex uh, web uh, server side uh, architecture they will be important but we are trying to be focusing on the client uh, and of course uh, um, all these components need to communicate with each other and basically the client and the server will uh, communicate over wider network over the internet usually may be it a wired connection a, a wife um, a mobile connection uh, a high-speed connection fiber connection we we don't care huh? as long as uh, like the internet promises like the ip protocol promises as long as i know your ip address well the 
internet infrastructure is able to make uh, uh, to allow us to uh, to communicate and of course also on the server side all these servers if there is more than one need to communicate with each other need to exchange data need to synchronize on what they, they are doing and so they must uh, be on uh, connected over a local network they probably with they also have some storage area network because uh, uh, they need to access uh, very um, very quickly a large amount of data and so they also the networking infrastructure on the server side is also important uh, again, this is an aspect uh, that we are not uh, uh, touching in the, in, in the rest of this course. Uh, just one uh, clarification about the uh, word uh, server, uh, because we may have two different definitions. Uh, server may be a word that we can interpret in a logical way or in a physical way. So a logical server is just a process, an application that is running on a host somewhere and is relaying information uh, to a client, uh, to its uh, own client, depending on the layer where we are living, uh, each server uh, provides information to uh, the layer above it, uh, which is the client uh, corresponds to that specific layer. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just a process, software process. And of course, the software process must run on a physical hardware somewhere. And so that's uh, that we call them a physical server in that case. So a physical server is a host computer, uh, it is a real computer that holds information and uh, responds to requests, but actually uh, hosts uh, the logical servers. So actually we have logical servers, software components that run on physical servers, which are hardware components, are hardware computers. And the mapping is not uh, fixed. Hmm? Uh, we may have uh, maybe some web, web applications that are not uh, too popular, not too complex, uh, and there are not much traffic. Uh, and so uh, from the point of view of the performance, uh, one single physical server is able to contain all the logical servers. So one physical machine will host the uh, web server, the application server, the database server, and whatever is needed on the same machine. So we may have many logical servers on the same physical server even maybe if it's more powerful the physical server may also host many different websites uh, each uh, of them with their own uh, logical servers but also the other way around uh, we may have a very popular website with, with a very high traffic uh, so one single um, physical server is not enough uh, to guarantee the scalability and uh, we need to replicate uh, uh, the same logical level, the same logical server, or across many different physical servers. So maybe we have uh, maybe uh, 10 front end machines, all, all of them are hosting uh, um, the web server layer. So logically, it's just one server, the web server layer, but this is split across many physical machines in order to balance the load and so on. The same happens at the database layer. We have distributed database system where the computation and storage is di distributed across different uh, machines to to be able to uh, to carry the, the computational load that is needed so the mapping between logical and physical server depends a lot on the performance depends a lot on the traffic the website has uh, is not a fixed one-to-one -one, but maybe many to one or one to many we'll try to uh, think about uh, logical levels for the moment uh, and uh, because the, the physical aspect uh, will come into play only uh, when we are thinking about uh, uh, scalability uh, of the system and right now we are not yet uh, uh, discussing that hmm. it's more an issue for the web application 2 course uh, where we'll see how to make the server more robust and more performant okay so let's start by uh, peeling the cake uh, by um, slicing the, um, the the pyramid that we saw and start to see what happens at the different layers uh, of the server side architecture the first layer is the web server layer the web server layer is the first slice uh, of the of the server side and uh, it's um it's quite simple actually actually the uh, the web server layer has only one job to do to manage the http protocol the web server uh, uh, only does this uh, only implements this functionality of course uh, it must implement it very efficiently very quickly and in a really optimized way because everything will pass through that uh, layer uh, the http protocol is quite simple we give us a, a little bit more detail about this uh, but you already know that from the 
computer network course uh, in, the, in the bachelor degree and uh, uh, it just is to receive to listen for new http requests that will come from different clients across the world and for each http request uh, it should provide a response usually a file uh, a response sent back to the client that, that requested that the specific resource or file or image or whatever and mm, so it's a uh, it's life cycle of the http server is just waiting for requests uh, processing the request there may be static pages or so files that are already available or dynamic pages uh, and in this case they will be delegated to the application server to the lower level because uh, dynamic pages are not the work of the web server and um, and then provide the response back and then everything begins from the beginning we start from the beginning um, basically we can think that every http request uh, opens a new connection uh, even if of course the http protocol is a bit more optimized than that uh, but uh, from a logical point of view we, it doesn't make any difference uh, on how we think because even if different requests share the same connection, they are logically treated as separate requests. So there's no data uh, exchange between them. And of course, the, the implementation technology for web servers is different. Uh, the, these are highly parallel uh, software because they need to listen and to respond to many different requests at the same time. And, um, and that the uh, say, uh, distributed programming techniques that are used to implement these web servers can be different. Uh, uh, in order to uh, achieve this level of parallelism uh, but again is not a detail that we are interested in right now so uh, we can have a bit more detail about uh, uh, our picture that we made before uh, where uh, for the moment uh, on the server side we are just focusing on the web server and in this case uh, how do the client and the server communicate through the http protocol that means that uh, uh, for every address that the client needs uh, and the client will need an address every time you write that uh, in the address bar of the browser or every time you click on a link then the browser will send to the server a data packet called http request and the uh, http request uh, will be directed to the server to its tcp ip address and will contain the path uh, of the resource uh, that the client wants uh, to, uh, to access, to, 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 to receive. Uh, the web server examines this path, uh, locates the file, let's imagine it's an HTML file, locates the file and sends the file back to the browser by packaging that into a frame that we call the HTTP response. That's it. That's the whole life cycle of the web server from the point of view of the web server. Something that we must remember is that web, web server, after it sent the response back, uh, is uh, allowed uh, or should be or must forget about the client so the the life cycle is closed when the um, web server sends the response back and then forgets about the client the next http request from the same client even if it's just two milliseconds after will be treated as a completely separate and different uh, request so that's why <coughs> It makes uh, the web server uh, very simple to use because it doesn't have to remember any state of the interaction. It just has to respond to every request separately and independently from the others. So we see that there's a, just a, a handful of technologies that are uh, coming to play here. Uh, a way for representing the addresses, a way for representing the pages, HTML, a protocol for exchanging them and of course uh, relying on the tcp ip oh, yeah, of course we have also have some graphical uh, images and so on but basically these four main technologies let's say three because tcp ip was already existing http html and url are enough for kickstarting the internet kickstarting web uh, technologies and uh, uh, we are all familiar with web addresses and we know that uh, they are composed uh, uh, or at least the three different parts. Uh, the first part is, the, is called the schema and in the context of the web uh, the schema is always HTTP or HTTPS which is the encrypted version of HTTP uh, because that characterized the, the, the architecture of the web. There may be other schema that are defined uh, but they are less and less used uh, today uh, every day more. Then we have the host part that represents uh, the name uh, the DNS name uh, of the server that will host the information that we need and after the host part we have the path part so that represent that identifies uh, the specific resource that we want inside this server so it's a hierarchical 
um, description where first we say who is containing the information and then we say what information would we want relative to this uh, container this host and so what happens uh, is that uh, every time we the browser needs to load a page it will first analyze the host part of the url and do a dns query so it's a lower level uh, query to translate this uh, uh, logical address to this, this host name into its uh, ip address and uh, once i have the ip address uh, the browser will uh, connect to the server will open a tcp connection to the server which hopefully is listening uh, on that port 80 for the TCP protocol and uh, uh, of course this, uh, this connection will um, exchange data according to the HTTP protocol so the, the TCP is con um, the browser is contacting the server over a TCP connection by using the HTTP protocol and basically it will send uh, an HTTP request message this HTTP request will contain especially the path part so the part was, is not used by the browser to uh, open the connection but it will be just included into the HTTP request and will be sent to the server so when the server which is here on the right uh, receives uh, this uh, this request uh, it receives basically a copy of this path uh, and it will try to uh, translate this path which is a logical identifier into a physical identifier so usually it has to rewrite this uh, string here into something that will match uh, with a physical file and if the file exists uh, well the server will uh, fetch it uh, read it and send it back to the browser using the http response which is not shown here so the different parts of the of the url are used uh, in different moments one for contacting the host uh, the other for the host uh, server to uh, to uh, identify the resource uh, inside uh, uh, its own file system or resource pool um, and the uh, content will be probably uh, an HTML file uh, at the beginning so uh, um, what, what we, we spend a few words about uh, uh, HTML uh, just to be on the same page uh, HTML is very is a very simple description language most of you are already probably familiar with that uh, from previous courses or for your own say curiosity and study um, we, we won't uh, spend a lecture on, on discussing HTML because it's a very basic topic so I will leave to you uh, if you uh, need to, ki uh, to kickstart yourself on HTML uh, there are these two pointers like uh, the tutorials that we find on the MDN on the developer network by Mozilla or maybe on W3 schools uh, <coughs> where you have a, a very uh, high number of uh, really basic uh, or in some cases two basic tutorials that describe uh, how um, HTML is made so we won't uh, describe all the HTML tags and structure in this course uh, uh, we will of course uh, uh, focus our attention basically on how to structure a web page uh, using the HTML tags in a modern way so like we are doing today not uh, like we were doing uh, 25 years ago when the HTML was the, uh, at the first steps so, hmm? but to understand that uh, we need to go up to the end of these classes because uh, we better understand the role of the html page but just to have a look uh, um, let me open for example a web page from wikipedia and uh, just to have some fun of it uh, i opened the coronavirus uh, page uh, which is normal web page from wikipedia we already saw uh, that contains uh, text that contains uh, formatted text of ballots and so on links uh, it contains images and so on so all of this uh, which is shown which is displayed by the browser uh, uh, is uh, uh, encoded in html uh, when uh, we request when we load this page from the server uh, the actual transfer between the server and the client uh, will be uh, an html file and we can see the file uh, with a view page source command uh, uh, or control u usually is working that will just show us uh, the con the html content of the page and if we s if we s s uh, have a look uh, at this content we skip through the uh, the file you see that it's a text file first of all in this case it's a text file of uh, 1100 lines so a bit more than 1000 lines and what does it contain it contains a mixture of information all the contents here are tagged so they are contained in some tag we have a meta tag we have a link tag we have div tag which is most, one of the most important ones uh, 
uh, we have a, a body of the doc of the, of the body is the tag where actually the, the, the document starts uh, we may have uh, links a stands for links div stands for container uh, we have tables uh, we have images somewhere and so on image let me see for me image emg tag like that we have images and so on so all the content of the page is described using different tags uh, and uh, html defines uh, some hundreds of tags uh, not, not, not much more and every tag which is called element in the formal definition may have some attributes so this is a an element td means table cell table data but we don't care at the moment at, at uh, listing all of them uh, these are the attributes for this uh, uh, tag for this element so, so this element is a td element with a set of attributes attributes are just a, a name with a value another name with another value and so on and this tag is a open here and closed there so the closing tag so all these tags are nested and the closing tag is a slash uh, and then repeats the name of the element so this is a whole element that also happens to contain some text and contains also nested into that uh, uh, other elements so this is a a element that is contained inside a td element which is contained inside a tr table row element and so on so it's a hierarchical structure described in a textual format uh, using this kind of opening and closing text so this is the general structure and all the content of the page is uh, encoded in this way Wh when we uh, have only the text uh, the textual part is just uh, included uh, uh, in line but when we have some images or, or some or some link or some other um, resources which are not pure text for example here's a, a text part uh, but then it contains a link and later on it contains an image and uh, uh, all these other resources like images uh, cannot be contained into the html file because of course the file the html is just a textual format so we need to have a way to access these external resources and to load them into the page so uh, if you are not familiar with that, this let's you can spend five or ten minutes on some of these tutorials to have some better understanding on the structure of the pages and, and, and the main text uh, maybe i would prefer the mdn version which is a bit more let's say uh, serious than the other one okay um again about uh, the addresses uh, we saw that uh, the web address in the, the simplest format is just a host and a path uh, but we will see that the uh, urls may also carry parameters uh, carry uh, query parameters that may uh, allow the server to customize the response according to the parameters that we give them or uh, uh, we will also use some uh, fragment syntax with the, where we have the hash sign to identify a portion inside the page so these are all variation of the URI uh, syntax or the URL syntax uh, um, that we may use uh, uh, later on but the basic idea uh, doesn't change okay uh, this is the host that will be contacted and all the rest uh, Will be sent to the uh, server and the server will need to interpret that uh, we mentioned the http protocol uh, and uh, just to say and we just would recall it and just to say that it's a real really simple protocol uh, it's made of two messages message types basically an http request and an http response an http request is like this uh, this is an actual uh, dump of a real http request uh, where <coughs> The there are two mandatory fields the first line and the second line and then there are some optional lines that are um, um, headers uh, of the that are called headers uh, of the http request so this is a http request uh, message type and the first line is the most important it will tell me the command the verb in this case get which is 99 percent uh, uh, the common that uh, that we use on the web we'll see more later uh get means uh, give me that resource and then space the name of the resource slash so the home page and then space and the and the protocol version that we are, uh, we are going to use so this is actually saying please server give me the home page give me the home page and i be aware that i am able to speak uh, this protocol version that's it all the information that the server needs is there 
the second line also repeats the name of the server because the name of the server is not included in the path because this is the path uh, portion of the url uh, the name of the server is repeated just for convenience because the server may have a multiple identity we may have many websites running on the same physical servers as we said before and so uh, the ip address will be shared uh, across many different websites so i must uh, must also specify okay you are this ip address but if you happen to have more websites uh, running uh, this is the one i want to, to to speak to so it's the home page of this website these are on the only two mandatory lines uh, and all the rest are uh, additional headers uh, that <coughs> the browser specifies the client specifies to um, to help the server uh, customize the response for him As, uh, for example the browser says uh, uh, oh, first uh, introduces himself i am this kind of, uh, of browser uh, and this uh, user agent string is a is a real mixture of, of, of different uh, uh, acronyms uh, uh, that may try to identify to the server what kind of browser and operating system we are running on and then uh, what kind of formats i want to accept so uh, I'm, i intend to the server well if you have a resource matching the request uh, encoded in text html i will be happy to get it or if you have it encoded in xhtml or xml i will get it or an XML, I will get it, and all of these uh, will be the preferred format uh, with the um, preference uh, 0.9. If you don't have any of these formats, uh, then do uh, give me whatever you have, so anything with a lower preference. So we are listing the kind of formats we are able to decode we, in, in order of preference. And the same for languages. If you have the web page in Italian, with preference 8, 0 0.8, uh, well, I prefer that. Otherwise, with preference 0 0.5, English American. Otherwise, with preference 0 0.3, English, and so on. So, in many cases, these attributes are uh, useless because the server only has one copy, one version of the resource. And so, it will give me that. But in many cases, in other cases, uh, the server may do, may do some content negotiation so it can adapt the content uh, given uh, to the specific uh, preferences of the user and uh, where does the browser knows these preferences usually well from the language in which you, you install the browser from the language in which you install the um, the operating system and also the browser is telling to the server if you want you can compress and code the response using the gzip algorithm or the deflate algorithm uh, so that we can save some uh, network uh, uh, data uh, if you want, yeah. If you want, I can accept this kind of encoding and so on. And uh, the, the server receives this package, analyzes that, and uh, if we are happy, it will uh, uh, have the resource that we need, and so it will give back a one simple response. So this is the HTTP response that the server is giving back to the browser. Uh, the main, the first line is the most important one. It will tell me what is the protocol version that we are using and of course uh, uh, the server will, will reply with a protocol version which is less than or equal than the maximum protocol requested by the browser so if i browser request uh, http 1.1 the server may reply with http 1.1 or 1.0 for example and then there's the uh, the status code this code has a state of, of 200 means uh, okay so two uh, you may be familiar with the three digit status codes uh, uh, all the status code that start with a 2 in the first place are uh, positive results uh, with 4 are errors from the uh, client uh, with 5 there are errors from the server um, 3 are redirections and so on mm -hmm. we'll see later on when we study more in detail the, the um, uh, HTTP APIs uh, uh, how we can use the status code so in this case uh, OK is just a textual representation of the same code so 200 and OK are redundant information, they, mod they both mean the same thing. And uh, mm, again, this is the line of the response and these are a set of headers uh, attached to this uh, response. And these headers uh, basically say, OK, but you browser uh, told me that you can accept the compression and I decided to encode the response using the gzip algorithm. And uh, the response in particular is of type text HTML, which is one of the types you requested and so on. 
so the server will tell the browser what what it did and uh, describe what kind of response is giving back um, describes uh, when is the time uh, where uh, it is uh, um, giving this response uh, and uh, what is the time where this, this page was last modified and uh, uh, it introduces itself uh, by saying what kind of uh, server it is and so on so uh, some metadata about the response all the response headers are here and then we have very important uh, blank line here and the start of the response the start of the document of the HTML page itself and this goes on for uh, how many lines we need we can also see that live if we open again our browser we can open the uh, inspector in the developer tools so in all the browser we have a web developer menu and uh, we open some tools usually ctrl shift i can open them also uh, that will give us uh, many tools to show to, to uh, understand what is happening inside the browser uh, so right now I'm uh, uh, opening the network, so we'll, we'll uh, be familiar with most of them. Right now we are interested in the, what happens at the network level. So I open the network tab and I reload the page here. So that I force the browser to request this page again. And we, you saw that I just made one click here to reload the page. And uh, uh, a lot of uh, lines have been printed here every line here is one http request so from what we see let's go back at the beginning we made one first request of type get uh, to this website uh, with this uh, uh, address url address uh, slash wiki slash coronavirus and what we received back was a, a file of type html which is 55 uh, kilobytes. Uh, the compressed version is 55 kilobytes. The, the full expanded version is 274. You see that the zip compression is working here. Let's uh, have a look at the details of this request. If I click on that, uh, I have a panel that I am trying to expand a bit. Uh, that will tell me uh, what was the HTTP exchange uh basically i have some oops sorry i wanted to make it bigger okay basically uh we have a request and a response and the request headers this is a, a original time all happened in a one second ago when we made the request okay the browser sent to the server this uh, an http request for the resource this one the URL with this set of headers if we want uh, we can also see the row headers which is the real request that the, the real set of headers that the browser sent uh, to the server hmm? so in the same format that we saw in the slide and here is much which more formatted to to, to, uh, to be more readable and then the server responded with an HTTP response uh, make that contains, uh, uh, for example, uh, say that this is text HTML encoded in UTF-8, and the whole page was 55 kilobytes long. So it will tell me it will tell me in advance uh, what is the size of the page. Um, uh, this page is uh, has been sent on 620 uh, of the 13th of March, but you, and it was modified in some way at the 16 at the 612, uh, 17, so three minutes before. Uh, my request and so on again we can see the raw headers so that was were, were sent by the server you see http2 they are using http2 protocol not 1.1 and uh, uh, okay this is the response and these the, are the response headers then we know that after the response headers we have uh, the response itself and if we click on the response we see that the response payload is the html file so it's the same html file that we saw before in the browser of course it's the same file but it was contained into the response of the first request um, and here we say from the timing point of view what happened uh, from the start of the request 
to the final to, to the end of the download uh, uh, all these requests took uh, 381 milliseconds from the browser point of view mm -hmm. sometime was the opening the connection sometime was uh, uh, receiving data and so on this for the first uh, request and then we have a, uh, um, a set of other requests that were triggered by the first one they were triggered because the HTML file was referencing some style sheets it was referencing some scripts it was referencing some images inside its uh, HTML text and so the browser in order to render this page needs uh, uh, to uh, to load these resources so to make additional HTTP connections to complete the page uh, for example this uh, image here sorry is uh, is this red pencil right there uh, we have other images uh, uh, here oh, like this lock so every visual element in the page even if it's a small one like this lock or a big one like this uh, uh, virus picture uh, needs to be need to be downloaded uh, one at a time with different uh, HTTP uh, connection then this connection may go to the same website here wikipedia.org or may go also to different websites in this case Wikipedia is very conservative so it doesn't spread requests around but may also link to external resources so one single HTTP request for the HTML file and many other additional HTTP requests for the additional resources that are needed to complete the page resources like images style sheets and scripts usually there are the three main categories of additional resources and uh, as we see from the timing panel uh, if i I'll try to ex let me try to expand that i wanted to zoom on the timing Okay, let, let me try to reload it so that we can. Okay, so you see that all of this is happening across time. So we have a first request with the HTML uh, code that will return the HTML page. After the page is received, then we have an additional batch of requests. Of course, these additional requests cannot start uh, before uh before receiving the html because before receiving the html we don't know what kind of resources we need and then once we know what the resources that we need we start additional requests that will respond in different times they are made in parallel to the web server so the web server in parallel will try to reply to me the browser has a limit on the number of parallel connections of course and then after this other resources are requested in a second batch and then we have a third batch for additional images uh, for example this one and uh, uh, another batch and so on for uh, svg images uh, that contain other portion of the page and this portion you see that we are already have three seconds uh, in the request so even if each of these requests only takes some milliseconds or tens of milliseconds the most the world's slowest ones uh, may take uh, hundreds of milliseconds it is also depends also on your, on your network connection or on a lot of factors but you see that a single request will trigger a series of uh, HTTP requests uh, um, and may take uh, several uh, seconds also to complete finally. So at the end, the browser tells us here at the bottom that uh, to complete this request, it made 33 requests. So for one page, was uh, one HTML file was expanded into 33 HTTP requests for a total of 500, uh, so half of a, half a megabyte uh, transferred and 1.2 megabytes uh, of data once they were expanded by the compression in total uh, it finished in three seconds uh, so slightly over three seconds which is a very slow time uh, today so we was uh, not very lucky uh, with this request right now okay uh, so this is a, what is happening under the hood every time you click on a link on a, on a browser this browser and the server keep exchanging this kind of messages uh, and uh, um, using the HTTP protocol so we already uh, saw the version some idea about the version of the HTTP protocol uh, the, this is a, um, a timeline that uh, suggests us uh, uh, the evolution something about the evolution of, of HTTP um, 
of course it was first invented in 1991 but the version that we are uh, all using today was in http 1.1 in 1997 and right now many websites are starting to move or moving to http 2. but one thing i want you to notice is the distance between these two points these two versions 1.1 1 .1 was defined in 1997 http2 was defined in 2015 and is being in, deployed in these years so uh, it's nearly uh, 20 years since uh, the, the the previous version so this version was the only one accepted over the internet for nearly 20 years and in many websites is still used today and this is a measure of success so the http 1.1 uh, standard was so successful that uh, there was there wasn't any need or real need to improve it or to create new versions it was enough it was simple enough uh, to be easy Im easily implemented it was quick enough uh, to guarantee a good performance it was flexible enough to accommodate for uh, many type of clients and many type of servers and that's why it was still uh, uh was well, well being continued uh, continuously used uh, and every uh, today a lot of applications are using http as their transport protocol instead of inventing or using some other more complex protocol so the the the, the good point of http is that it's really really very simple and so it can be accommodated for many kind of different applications of course http2 now is more sophisticated it, it supports encryption it supports uh, uh, multi-threading support push uh, connection and a lot of other uh, features that make it more complex uh, it's uh, more efficient for web applications uh, but it's less versatile for uh, many other kinds of, uh, of applications so it started to be deployed especially on high traffic websites um, okay we saw that the browser contains already a developer tools uh, in different browsers we have different layouts but they basically give you all the tools for inspecting uh, and analyzing what is happening uh, in the at the HTML level and the at the HTTP level and uh, at the JavaScript level mm. uh, we uh, we saw some numbers uh, about the performance uh, and uh, um, basically if we want to measure the performance of a, of a web connection we can do that you know with a very simple first order model by using two parameters uh, the latency can be defined as the time required for providing a zero byte http page so let's imagine that we have a resource which is very short zero bytes one byte uh, the request always still takes the time to compose the request message send it through wait for the response of the server and receive the response back when we receive the response back, uh, okay, this request of, of a zero byte page is uh, finished. So we did a lot of overhead of, ex of uh, encoding, decoding, compacting, and sending, and so on, and uh, we don't have any byte yet. This is a startup time for every HTTP connection. Uh, the latency, uh, it, you know, sometimes it's also called the first to, uh, sorry, the time to first byte, TTFB, time to first byte. Um, so it's the number of milliseconds before the actual transfer may happen uh, we saw that uh, first in the pictures then in the, in the, in the browser that the, uh, the the real transfer started some milliseconds after the request after the response so that is a latency time and then once the response starts uh, to be received uh, it can be it can flow through at a given uh, network speed so in megabyte per second how many uh, so we can approximate the throughput definition by saying okay the speed at which uh, an infinite size page uh, can be sent so if uh, if i have a very large page i need to push it of course the latency will be negligible with respect to the transfer time mm. so we have uh, a very simple uh, formula that tells that more or less the, the time of our HTTP request uh, is the contribution of a latency uh, so uh, from the time we send a request to the time the response starts arriving plus a time of transfer and the transfer is uh, uh, depends on the size of the response and uh, the throughput uh, of the network connection mm -hmm. so it's a, it's a first uh, first order model just to understand what may be responsible or what part um, of course the throughput is mainly a bandwidth issue the response size is something that is depends on the on the content creator on the server side and the latency also is a network issue usually and also a load issue if that if a server is overloaded then its latency will be low, uh, will be higher because it will need to enqueue your request before serving that 
um, and so what happens is that the, uh, in the time uh, in a timeline a user requests an address clicks on a link or writes an address uh, the browser prepares the rest the HTTP request and the time t1 will send the request across the network and the request will reach the server at time t2 the server will receive it accept it process it and uh, interpret the request and when the path is known it, well, it will identify a file which is what will be re read from the disk and then once i read the, uh, the file i will compose the http response uh, and once i have the http response composed at time t7 i will send it back to the browser okay so this uh, it takes a longer time usually because the response is larger than the request so it will take more time and the browser will receive the response here and will process it and display it to the user so at this point at t9 the, the http page is shown in display to the user at this point the user can look at the page do whatever it wants but it doesn't interact with the browser or with the network anymore until the user will click on a link and then all the process will restart from the beginning this is for one http request so if we want to measure them you can see how many requests per second we give which is not the same be careful to the number of pages per second that we received we see that in the example of that wikipedia page the, there is a ratio of 33 requests for one page so always be careful when you see the numbers if they're talking about raw http requests or they're talking about complete page loads hmm? because pumping the statistics uh, uh, is also a risk um, okay these are just some names for the time interval that we saw before and uh, uh, for this first level we have uh, uh, we, we are composing a, a, a simple picture of our architecture and this picture will increase uh, along the discussion we will add uh, several pieces uh, one after the other in order to get a, a complete picture a full picture about uh, uh, what's happening uh, for the moment we know that uh, we have a browser and we have a web server these two communicate over the internet uh, with a very simple exchange i send you an address uh, and you give me the file content back and this content may be an html file or maybe maybe some other resource uh, for example an image the web server does not make any distinction between the, the types of files it doesn't care it just gets the files and returns it to the browser the browser needs uh, to interpret the meaning and the content of the file that it receives uh, in particular if it's uh, an html file it must start a layout engine to understand the content of the file and uh, display it on the screen to the user so we have the users here that will receive the content of our page and will interact with the web with the browser by clicking on link or writing text uh, uh, with the keyboard the browser offers the user interface to the uh, to the user and uh, uh, the what the user sees on the screen comes out from the layout engine that uh, was in, um, decided by interpreting the content of the HTML file that somebody on the server wrote some time ago in HTML. Uh, the browser uh, in, in green, I, I, I'm drawing the, uh, the standard blocks. So browser is a standard block. I don't need to change browser if I visit different websites. It's one or a single type of software. And the layout engine only relies on the semantics or html it doesn't uh, need to know what uh, uh, specific website that i'm visiting so this is a standard component uh, the web server also it's a standard component because it doesn't need to understand anything about the website it just needs to pick the right file and send it back very efficiently the blue parts are the parts that are that that should be created by the web developer so these are the programmable or the custom components so we'll keep this uh, this convention in this picture so green means standard and uh, uh, blue means uh, uh, customized uh, standard uh, in the case of the browser we have of course many different browsers i tried to collect some of the icons here uh, that they work in the same way on the on, on principle of course uh, uh, they differ on some details uh, of performance of support to the languages and so on uh, but in general for us uh, we'll talk about the browser as the architectural component that fits this role in, in this picture 
okay so this is the basic uh, uh, picture and we we'll try to make it more uh, more complex right now we can only uh, visit websites composed of html files uh, before moving on let's have a look at the web server i said it's a standard component uh, and mean i mean really standard and standardized uh, there is not a strong uh, there's not a uh, say a uh, law or something that um, forces you to standardize web servers but the, the market actually the developer decide uh, these are some statistics coming from that netcraft uh, the, uh, these uh, urls so that, uh, they are updated to january 2020 uh, they're quite uh, recent then tell us uh, the share so these are shared graphs so the, the sum of, at any point in time is always 100 percent uh, of all the websites uh, across the different type of web server so whether a web server is a software and maybe we have different software makers that make uh, alternative uh, web servers uh, uh, that we can use in our web website it turns out that one of the most uh, popular the blue line here um, software for web servers was the apache web server which is an open source product another very popular one the green one you see growing growing and growing so taking shares and right now is the top most shared um, and top most used uh, popular in the um, in this chart uh, is the nginx which is also an evolution and simplification of apache to be more uh, simpler to use and uh, faster also to, to deliver uh, so the first one is nginx and the second one today is apache and then we have other two servers uh, one is the microsoft internet information services which is done here and then others uh, uh, that are there uh, there were many evolution and you see if you should read this news they also explain you what happened in the meantime but what we are seeing is that there are one two three web servers that actually cover 85 percent of all websites if we restrict our attention to the active sites so the sites that are still active today and not discontinued and not uh, abandoned uh, there is less difference so the, this chart is more noisy and this is much cleaner uh, because we are just selecting a subset of websites that are still running but the the picture is the same the main uh, browsers are, 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 are these three apache and jinx and others and the microsoft sorry and finally if we focus on the top million business sites so the the, the curve flatten even more if we reduce the attention to one million websites which is a very big number and we see again that we have three contenders here that are sharing uh, most of the uh, of the software running the internet most of the internet is running on open source software on a very slow number of components so how how can it be well it's easy because the web server doesn't need to care about the website so you can build uh, from facebook uh, uh, to uh, maybe your own uh, uh, website personal website uh, and the software that needs uh, to manage the http protocol is the same it doesn't need to be different and so uh, we, we could uh, standardize on a few version of software web server softwares and uh, uh, to in invest on those make them uh, really efficient really fast uh, and so that everybody is in them so that the strength uh, of this uh, uh, of these technologies there, there is a component which is the key that puts together uh, the um, the internet together and it's uh, uh, free basically and uh, uh, it's uh, it doesn't need to be programmed or configured or anything else uh, because it's, it has a standard behavior that can be used okay so before moving to the to the lower layer i would uh, just for the for the sake of uh, of manageability of the of the classes and the video i would stop here and uh, we'll start uh, uh, the next video talking about the second layer the application layer of the um, of the server architecture